let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Yeah. Well, I would propose to you that in order to understand it, we really need to grasp the Old Testament allusions, the, the, this, the references to salvation history that are found in Revelation 20. Many of our non-Catholic friends will tell us that it has to be a literal reign on earth because God promised this to David. They'll point out in 2 Samuel 7 that God said that David would have a kingdom and that this kingdom would be given, be on earth. So therefore, in order for this promise to David to be fulfilled, we have to have that earthly political reign of Jesus. As I'll explain in a minute, I think we can understand that Jesus fulfills that in an even more profound way than simply through an earthly fulfillment. Uh, let's look at that promise, by the way, in 2 Samuel 7. God says to David, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for a thousand years. Oh, wait, that's not what it says. Forever, right? Forever. So how does God fulfill this promise to David? That his son would build a house for his name and that he would reign for a thousand years. Well, I think that's what Revelation 20 is helping us to look at and understand, all right? Uh, how do we interpret Revelation 20? Again, we got to understand the Old Testament context. And when you look at the passage closely, you'll see all sorts of allusions that are especially linked to the Davidic covenant. All sorts of images that are tied to the Davidic covenant. It's interesting. It describes the devil being bound for a thousand years. Isn't it, is it just a coincidence? Isn't it remarkable that David begins his reign in 1000 B.C.? For 1,000 years before the coming of Christ, there is a kingdom that is really established on earth. The devil is said to be bound by this chain. An angel comes down, takes a key, and shuts him up. Well, the language here is, again, Davidic. Even within the book of Revelation, the image of a key is linked to David. Revelation chapter 3, 7. The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and none shall shut, who shuts and none shall open. We also see in Revelation 9 this image of this key that is used to seal up a bottomless pit. Where does this imagery of a key come from? Well, it comes to us, as we all know, I'm sure many of you know, from the book of Isaiah, where God explains through the prophet Isaiah how a wicked official in the Davidic kingdom is going to be replaced. Eliakim is going to receive the office that Shebna was unfaithful in. And we read in Isaiah 20 this, In that day I will, call Eli I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your girdle on him, and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, none shall shut. He shall shut, none shall open. In Revelation 20, we read about an angel that comes down with a key, and he shuts up the devil in this bottomless pit. Ancient readers would have understood, especially given the fact that Jesus has already been described as the one who holds the keys, right? In Revelation 3, 7, the key of David, they would have understood that this imagery was referring to the Davidic kingdom. In fact, we know that the Davidic kingdom was, in a sense, uh, if you've taken that journey through Scripture series, the tool which God used, as we'll see, to, in fact, shut up the devil in the Old Testament to curtail his activity through the Davidic kingdom, God begins to extend his covenant blessings to the world. But what was important about the Davidic kingdom wasn't the fact that it was an earthly political kingdom. 
It was the spiritual realities that were ultimately important. What was the Davidic covenant linked to? I just looked at the promise in a, a, a moment ago. God promises that the son of David is going to build a house for his name. What house is that? It's a reference to the temple. And if you've taken that JTS series, you know that the Davidic kingdom, the Davidic covenant, is inextricably linked to the temple. So it's interesting, in Isaiah 22, the prime minister, or the official that's referred to here, isn't simply described as one having political authority. He wears the long robe and the girdle. There's only one person in the Old Testament who wears those garments. You know who he is? The high priest. In Exodus 28 and Leviticus 8, we read that these are the garments the high priest wears. He's also said to be a father. Well, which which individuals in the Old Testament were known as spiritual fathers to Israel? The priests. You see this, for example, in Judges chapter 17. And so when it describes how this figure, Eliakim, is going to have the key to the house of David, is it simply talking about political authority? No. It's talking about liturgical authority. And so if you read the ancient Jewish writings, they were unanimous. The key to the house of David is a priestly image. The key to the house of David refers to the key to the temple. In fact, in the Old Testament, the idea of keys are closely linked to the temple. First Chronicles 9.27 tell us that the priests sleep in the temple and have charge over the key of the temple. Josephus, a first century historian, describes the importance of the priestly keys. Every day, the priests would gather in the temple, well not every day, but on certain days, the priests would gather in the temple for a sort of changing of the guard ceremony, where one division would pass on the priestly responsibility of serving in the temple to another division of priests. And how did they symbolize that passing on of priestly responsibility? We read about it in Josephus' writings. He says, For although there be four courses of the priests, and every one of them have about 5,000 men in them, yet do they officiate on certain days only. And when those days are over, other priests succeed in the performance of their sacrifices and assemble together at midday and receive the keys of the temple and the vessels by tail without anything relating to food or drink being carried into the temple. How is it that the priestly responsibility is passed on? through the passing on of the keys, right? And you also see this in other rabbinic writings. I wish I had time to go through them all. The Mishnah tells us that uh, a collection of rabbinic saints dated about the second century AD, uh, that the priests used to sleep with the keys of the temple court in their hand. So when you see the image of the key in Revelation 20, it's not simply talking about political authority. It's linked to David clearly in Revelation, but it's linked especially to liturgical authority. Now, it's interesting, given the fact that you have the keys linked to the temple, that we go on to read in Revelation 20 about a bottomless pit. Because if you know your ancient Jewish literature, you'll realize that the bottomless pit is also linked to temple traditions. Let me explain. In ancient Judaism, it was understood that the temple was built on a foundation stone. All right? And this foundation stone plugged up Sheol, Sheol, the, the netherworld, which is described in the Old Testament as a pit. You see this, for example, in Zechariah 4. We read about Zerubbabel, who is a descendant of David. He builds the temple, and we read, Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Scholars understand what this is describing. The temple building ceremony. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So if you read ancient rabbinic writings, you'll see it was understood not only Zerubbabel, but other sons of David were associated with building the temple, consecrating the temple. Solomon in particular is said to have built the temple on, like Zerubbabel, a foundation stone. Well, if you keep reading in the Old Testament, you'll find that the foundation stone is linked to Sheol, to the bottomless pit of death. You see this, for example, in Isaiah 28. Because we, you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we have an agreement. When the overwhelming scourge passes through it, will not come to us. 
For we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. He who believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters will overwhelm the shelter." Then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. So notice that Sheol is linked to the waters, but what are being, what's God's way of holding back, in a sense, the powers of death and Sheol? The foundation stone. Foundation stone of what? The local library. No. The foundation stone of the temple, right? And it's no surprise that when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, 1QHA, you read that the foundation stone is linked to nothing less than the gates of death. Right? Rabbinic tradition, like I said, linked the foundation stone of the temple with the waters of the netherworld. There's this interesting story. Now, this story comes from a later source, so scholars might dispute whether or not John knew it when he book, wrote the book of Revelation, but given the fact that the book of Revelation is pulling together all these images, the key that's linked to the temple, the bottomless pit, uh, the, the binding of Satan, which I'll talk about in a minute, I think there's a real good possibility that this story from a rabbinic source preserves an ancient tradition, uh, because very clearly in Jesus' day, these images of the foundation stone and the temple were linked together. Here's an apocryphal story about David building the temple that I think uh, is interesting, given our text. When King David came to dig the foundations for the temple around the foundation stone, he dug to a depth of 1,500 cubits, and he found a projecting stone, which he wished to remove. But the stone said to him, This thou canst not do. David asked, Why not? And it answered, I cover the mouth of the abyss. But David would not hearken and wished to remove the stone. And as he tried, the waters of the abyss rose in great torrents, which appeared to be about to flood the world. Then David began to sing the song of degrees, Psalm 120 to 134, from the book of Psalms and the waters of the abyss return to their place. In fact, even today, this idea of a foundation stone is understood is, is, is uh, this tradition is kept alive in Jerusalem. The temple no longer stands in Jerusalem, but on its place today, you'll see a Muslim mosque. If you're familiar with the Jerusalem skyline, you recognize that golden dome. What is it called? The dome of the? So the dome of the rock that the temple was built on, right? It's that sacred stone that the temple was built on that plugged up the abyss. You see this imagery in Revelation 20. And again, the imagery is linked to the Davidic kingdom. All right. What else? We have the binding of Satan. The binding of Satan, the angel comes down, binds him with a chain. It's interesting that binding the devil is language for exorcism in the Bible. Satan is bound. Read any uh, treatment of Matthew 16 where it says that he, uh, Peter has the authority to bind and loose, and you'll see that one interpretive option of that passage is exorcism. Jesus is giving Peter the authority to cast out demons because that language of binding and loosing is linked to spiritual warfare. And so it's not a surprise. Here we have another Davidic image. David and Solomon were known as exorcists. You see this, for example, in 1 Samuel 16. We read, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And whenever the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre, and played it with his hands. I think when we think of David in the Old Testament, what image do we conjure up? A king that played a guitar, that had a lot of hits, there was scandal around him. For a lot of people, I think David is little less than the Elvis of the Old Testament, you know? The king with all the hits, there's some scandal. But David was more than just a rock singer. He was more than just uh, a superstar musician. David was a man after God's own heart. And so what's amazing about David's songs is that when David sings, they actually have exorcistic, they actually have the capacity to drive out demons. They have exorcistic um, faculties, capabilities. So we read in 1 Samuel 16, Whenever the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. And of course, this ability of David 
to cast out demons, was also known to be passed on to Solomon. In the ancient world, in the ancient Jewish world, Solomon was known as the greatest of all the exorcists. It's described, for example, in Wisdom 7.20, how the Lord gave him knowledge over evil spirits. Josephus and other Jewish writings talk about Solomon's role as an exorcist. So how does this relate to Revelation 20? Well, in Revelation 20, it says that the angel comes down and he binds Satan with a great chain. How does this relate to the Davidic covenant? Well, I'd like to point out that the word exorcism, exorcists, comes from a Greek term, exorkidzo, which means to oath out. How do you exorcise a demon? With an oath. How do you cast out the demon? With an oath. Let's see now. Is there any oath attached to the Davidic covenant? Let's see here. Yes, there is. We know that God gave the kingdom of David through an oath. And because of that oath, God's kingdom extends throughout the world. For one brief shining moment in the Old Testament, we see God's reign through the son of David being acknowledged not only by Israel, but by the nations. In 1 Kings 4.21, we read, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. Sound familiar? Remember what God promised Abraham? Your descendants will be like the sand of the sea. They ate and drank and, oh, that's a typo. Well, if you drink too much, then you would be happy, I suppose. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days. I can't believe I did that of his life. I'm sorry, it's kind of distracting. <laughs> We know that through this oath that God swore to David, God's covenant was extended to the nations. David even understood this. In 2 Samuel 7, David says, And yet this was a small thing in my eyes, O Lord God. You have shown me a law for mankind, in Hebrew, a Torah for Adam, a, a law for all humanity. The Davidic covenant isn't simply given for David's sake. It's not simply given for Israel's sake, but for all the nations. So really... You have in the Old Testament a case where God swears an oath, and by doing so, Satan is curtailed. His activity is held back. Right? In the Davidic covenant, through the, through the ministry of David, who's not just a king but a priest, through Solomon's ministry, he's not just a king but a priest, through his authority, which is found not simply in his palace, but in the house of God, in the temple, which is linked with the key, through these realities, the devil is bound. And it is interesting. The word for exorcism, exorkidzo, can also be translated putting under oath. Putting under oath. You see that in Matthew 6, uh, 26, 63. So this tradition that, that Solomon was able to put people under oath, that he was an exorcist, that he was able to cast out demons, that he had authority over the evil forces, was encapsulated in a very interesting Jewish tradition. It was said that in Solomon's court, there was a chain that, held, that hung from a ceiling. And when people would come in to give testimony in the court of Solomon, they would hold on to this chain. And if they told a lie, guess what would happen? The link in the chain that they held on to would miraculously drop from the chain, all right? Now, that's a, a nice story, but what it does is it illustrates Solomon's ability to cast out demons, to have power over evil spirits, to discern evil spirits, right? It emphasizes his authority in a spiritual way to bind Satan. So this whole idea of putting under oath, of swearing, is linked to uh, Solomon's authority as an exorcist. So in Revelation 20, we have an angel who comes down and he brings a key to a bottomless pit. Satan is held up in that a bottomless pit because of a chain that he is bound by. How is the devil bound in the Old Testament? I would submit to you that, in fact, ancient Jews would have understood that in the Davidic kingdom, Satan was bound for a thousand years in the ministry of the Davidic kingdom. Through the oath that God swore to David, he was the devil was, in a sense, exercised. He was bound. He was chained, right? But it goes on to say that at the end of this time, he will be loose for a little while. 
Well, what might that refer to? Well, look at what happens in the Gospels. Jesus explains that in his day, which would be the end of the thousand years, the thousand years of the earthly Jerusalem, the thousand years of that earthly prototype of what is to come, Jesus explains in that time, the people were more wicked than any other generation who had ever lived. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, the wicked nations of the Old Testament, which were judged by God, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, get this, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Wow. Matthew 12, Jesus says, The queen of the south, that is the queen of Sheba, who came and heard the wisdom of Solomon, the queen of the south will arise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And then Jesus has something very scary to say. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he passes through the waterless places, seeking rest, but he finds none. The waterless places. Uh, there is likely a link here to the waters of Sheol and and the netherworld, but I don't have time to get into it. Verse 44, then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. So an unclean spirit comes out of a man. He's driven out. Then he returns, and he finds that man holy, sanctified. His soul is clean and swept. Then he goes, and he brings with him seven other spirits, more evil than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. I don't know if any of you have been involved with youth ministry. <clears throat> I have been involved with this. <clears throat> and you'll do retreats, and you'll see these kids catch on fire for the Lord. And you are so grateful that they've come to know God, but then they go back out into our secular culture, and you see them a year later, and they're worse off than they were before they experience that grace of conversion. And it doesn't just happen to teenagers, but to people at all stages in their life. These are scary words. It's one thing to not understand the gospel. It's another thing to hear it, to understand it, and then to not put it into practice. But look at what Jesus says. He's not simply speaking about an individual person. He says, so it shall be with this evil generation. Jesus explains that his generation is the most wicked of all the generations who have lived. If there's ever a time when it seems that Satan has been loosed for a little while, it would seem to apply to his own day. 